Are you looking for an easy PixInsight workflow that you can follow along with? This video takes my PixInsight process tutorials and puts them together into a basic workflow that anyone can follow. Hey everyone, it's Tony with Hidden Light Photography. And today is the day where my PixInsight process tutorials come together into a workflow. So if you haven't done so yet, hit that subscribe button. I don't want you to miss out on any valuable information. And we're going to be walking through a basic PixInsight tutorial. And I'm going to show you how all those processes come together. So let's head on over and see how a basic PixInsight workflow is done. For the basic PixInsight workflow video, we're going to be working with our closest galactic neighbor, M31 or Andromeda. And I like to think of a PixInsight workflow like restoring an old car. More specifically, the bodywork and paint portion of it. You'll use corrective actions on the body of the car in order to get it ready for paint. And you'll use processes like welding, metal shaping, whatever it takes to remove the imperfections of the body so you have the best possible outcome when you paint. And then you'll spray your base coat and clear coat, which finalizes all of that hard work that you did on the body. And then you move to beautification, buffing, polishing. And the same goes for processing an image. You'll take corrective actions on the image in the beginning, such as background extraction, color calibration, balancing your color channels, star correction, noise reduction. And then you finalize that data with stretching, which is going to be just like spraying your base coat and clear coat. And then you move to beautification. You'll adjust saturation curves, possibly fine tune the contrast between your deep sky object and the background. And there's a phrase that I love, months to prep, a day to paint. And what that means to me is, the more attention to detail that you put into the corrective stages, the better the outcome and the easier it is to get there. Now, a lot of these processes you're about to see, I have individual tutorials on. And the ones that I don't, the reason I did that is it's a lot easier to show you in the middle of a workflow. But if you want me to make individual tutorials on those, just let me know. I'm more than happy to do so. Now, to get things started, we're going to open up our master light file, and this is going to be whatever you specified as the output file within WBPP. So we're going to go to File, Open, and we're going to navigate to whichever folder you specified as the output folder in WBPP, in this case, M31. Now this might look a little bit different than what you see. And the only reason is, is WBPP spits out a lot of information. You'll have registration files, log files, all of that stuff, you don't need it. It's large, it takes up a lot of room. I just delete it. And what I leave myself with are my individual subframes from each night of imaging, my, uh, light frames, dark frames, flat frames, and dark flat frames. And then I also leave my master files. Now, when you go into your master folder, you'll see your master reference frames, master dark frames, and master light frames. Now, all of these master light frames, they are different versions of your different color channels. I like WBPP to separate my color channels process individually, and then recombine. And this is a uh, results may vary scenario. So personally, the data that I have, I get better results when WBPP separates the color channels, processes them individually, and puts back together. You may or may not experience that same result. So try it both ways and see how it works for you. What we're concerned about right now is the master light frame or the master light file combined RGB auto crop as you see here. And then you have the master light combined RGB. 
which has not been auto cropped. Now, WBPP does a good job with auto cropping. Sometimes I just like to put my own touch on an image. And for this example, there's something I want to show you that you need to be aware of. So we're going to use the non auto cropped image. Now you're probably thinking, um, why do I have all of those light frames and then I just use a combined RGB? Well, this is going to make sense in just a moment. Um, first, when you open your image, you'll notice that it's dark. And that's okay. We just need to apply an auto stretch. Now, to do that, we're going to go to process, all processes, and we're going to go to screen transfer function. Now, anytime you stretch an image, you need to make sure that 24 bit stretch factor is enabled. That's going to be right up over here at my cursor. See how it's not highlighted? If we click on it, it's highlighted. Now, 24 bit stretch factor is enabled for this image window. And anytime you have a new image window, you have to re enable 24 bit stretch factor. The next thing you need to be aware of. In screen transfer function, this little link icon, notice how it's highlighted. The color channels are linked. That means that screen transfer function is going to stretch all of your color channels equally across the board. On the flip side, if we unlink the color channels, now screen transfer function is going to stretch all of your color channels independently. And this radiation icon, if you click that, it will stretch the image. Screen transfer function will stretch the image. However, you have it specified between linked and unlinked. Now, why do I have all of my color channels, but then I work with a combined RGB image? I First, I want to see the potential of my image of my data, I should say. And then I want to view if my color channels are balanced or not. And in order to do that, we need to view them combined. So that's why I use the combined RGB image. First, we want to look at the potential of our data. And in order to do that, we're going to view an unlinked stretch. So 24 bit stretch factor is active. We're going to see how our image window is gray. We're going to click on it to select it. The link icon is not highlighted, so we are not linked. Thus, screen transfer function is going to stretch all of the channels independently. Now we hit the radiation icon, and here we go. Here is the potential of our data. Now, if we link the channels, causing screen transfer function to stretch all of our color channels equally across the board and hit the radiation icon, we have a much different picture. Now we know that our color channels are not balanced. So how do we balance them? Well, we need to determine the most prominent channel. Now, you may have a blue cast like you see here, but that's not always the case. You might have a red cast, you could have a green cast, or you can have a blue cast like you see here. Don't ever assume that the cast that you see is your most prominent channel. It's not always the case. So how do we find out? What we're gonna do is we're gonna go to process, all processes, and we're gonna go down to statistics. Now, our image name is always at the top of our image window. In statistics, the top drop down menu, we're going to click and we're going to select our image. Now, we see our red channel, green channel, and blue channel. And the value that we're concerned of is the mean value. Okay. Now, when statistics comes up, usually it will 
look like this right here. In the original take of this video, I made a mistake. What I didn't realize or notice is if you look, E minus 0, 3, and that's present on red and green channels. Blue channel is E minus 0, 2. Now the E minus 0, 2 means that the decimal point is going to shift left two places. Whereas on the red and green channel, E03, the decimal point is going to shift left three places. I didn't realize that. I didn't notice it. And I accidentally chose the green channel as the most prominent channel because I saw the bigger number right here. How do you prevent that from happening? The normalized reel drop down, you'll see different selections. If you choose any of these, let's take 12 bit for example, that number is now a lot easier to read. 14 bit, still easier to read and 16 bit, still easier to read. And it's obvious here that the blue channel is in fact the most prominent channel in this image. Now, again, never assume the cast that you see is the most prominent channel. Always use statistics and use the hard data to determine your most prominent channel. Now we can exit out of statistics. And how do we balance the channels? Well, now we need to separate them. This icon right over here at my cursor, if we click, now we have the individual channel separated. We have B for blue, G for green, and R for red. Now, quick little tip here. Um, you can use screen transfer function to um, stretch a grayscale image or on a grayscale image, I just hit control A especially if my screen transfer function is buried somewhere, control A will work just fine on grayscale. I always use screen transfer function to stretch a combined RGB image though. So always use screen transfer function to stretch a combined RGB image. However, grayscale, you can just hit control A. Let's go ahead and minimize our primary image for the time being. For the sake of space, we'll just move it out of the way. For each of our color channels, red, green, and blue, we're gonna enable 24-bit stretch factor and give them a quick stretch. So for our blue channel, 24-bit stretch factor, control A. Green channel, 24-bit stretch factor, control A. Red channel, 24-bit stretch factor, control A. Now, to do the balancing. What we're gonna do is we're going to go to process, all processes, linear fit. Now, linear fit is asking for a reference image. And that reference image is going to be our most prominent color channel, whichever one it might be in your image. In this case, it's gonna be the blue channel. So what we're gonna do over at my cursor, this little icon, click, drop down, and we're going to choose our blue channel. Hit OK. Now we can minimize the blue channel. We don't need that anymore. We're going to take the triangle. Currently right here, we have our red channel, triangle, drag and drop. And you're going to see some weird things happen with these images. That's OK. You did not break the image. All we're gonna do, ensure 24-bit stretch factor is active. Click on the image, in this case, the red channel. See how it turned blue, now it's active, control A. We're gonna minimize the red channel, move it out of the way. Now we have our green channel, triangle, drag and drop. And again, you're gonna see some goofy things happen. You did not break the image. Ensure 24-bit stretch factor is active. Select the uh, color channel window. Control A, minimize, and move out of the way. Now, our red, green, and blue channels are balanced in accordance to our most prominent color channel. We're gonna exit out of linear fit. Now we need to combine our newly balanced channels together. And what we're gonna do is go to process all processes, 
channel combination. Ensure RGB is selected for the blue channel over at my cursor. Click that icon, drop down, select your blue channel, hit OK. For the green channel over at my cursor, click that icon, drop down menu, select your green channel, hit OK. And for the red channel over at my cursor, select the icon, drop down, red channel, and hit OK. And then we're going to hit the circle. And now we can exit out of channel combination. Our newly balanced color channels are now combined into an RGB image. Now we no longer need our individual color channels, so we can just exit out. And what this is stating is that if we close out of these, we're going to lose any unsaved data. That's okay. They're already combined into an RGB image, so we no longer need them. So we'll just hit yes. Now, let's bring our newly combined RGB image off to the side. Screen transfer function at the bottom and out of the way. We'll bring up our um, original RGB image. Now, what we have here is our new image using our freshly combined color channels that have been balanced. We're going to select our new image, ensure 24-bit stretch factor is enabled, ensure that screen transfer function is linked, just like our original image is, hit the radioactive icon, and we have a much different image now because now our color channels have been balanced. So now, our original image on the right, all color channels have been stretched equally across the board. We had an imbalance, and we can see that. Now, all color channels in our new image are also stretched equally across the board, but now they're balanced, so we have a much better image. In fact, if we unlink the channels, click the radioactive icon, watch the galaxy, there's unlinked, and here's linked. We are as close as we can get. From here on out, we're going to be working with the channels linked. So now we can exit out of our original image. Now what we need to do is run a star correction. These algorithms that we're going to be using go off of pixel values and any imperfections in the stars can cause goofy results that you don't want to deal with. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Process, All Processes, Blur Exterminator. We're going to go to Correct Only. Now, Blur Exterminator, I have an individual tutorial on, so if you need additional help, please view that tutorial. I'll have a link to it in the description of this video. Once we click Correct Only, Triangle, Drag and Drop. Now, as processing over here gets towards 100%, watch what happens with the stars. Blur Exterminator does a very good job. There you go. See how they just shrunk? They just got corrected. And this is now setting the stage for dynamic background extraction. So now we can exit out of Blur Exterminator for the time being. Again, if you need additional help, check out the link in the description of this video. Now, before we run background extraction, dynamic background extraction, there's one thing I need to show you. And this is where using a non-auto cropped image comes into play. If we zoom into our image and we go to the edges, what you're looking for are heavy differences at the edges of your image, okay? Um, always run the edges of your image. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if the video can pick this up, but you'll see between where my cursor is and then up over here, the line is roughly right around here, there's a difference. But I already know where the big areas are, so let's just jump over to them. Check that out. That's not good. These drastic differences between uh, in the background, 
right, between this section of the background over at my cursor and this section. That's going to cause dynamic background extraction to get confused with the pixel values and creating a, uh, a worse scenario. So we need to get rid of this, okay? In fact, if you take a look, there's a difference. This is the line roughly right over here between this section of background at my cursor and this section as well. So always check your edges. Make sure you don't have any abnormalities or anything like that because it can definitely inhibit the effectiveness of dynamic background extraction. You can see a little bit up over here. But if we come all the way to the right, see this right over at my cursor and you have vertical lines that run all the way down. So I'm just gonna run through the uh, edges really quick here. The bottom portion is more prominent over here. If you look at my cursor, the line being right in here. So how do we get rid of that? First of all, what is that? These, what you're seeing here, this is called stacking artifacts. This image was uh, taken over the course of multiple nights. We have dithering. We also have, um, due to being over multiple nights, we have um, slight rotational differences between each night. And then you stack it all together, which leaves the edges with stacking artifacts. And it's perfectly normal. So what we need to do to get rid of those bad edges, we just crop them out. So we're going to go to process all processes and we're going to go to dynamic crop. And then what you're going to do, you'll see your crosshairs. You're just going to grab a section and you're going to crop your image. You can crop it however you want. There's no right or wrong answer. Just make sure that you have those imperfections removed from the image so you don't have any issues okay uh, once you have your cropping window set all you do is hit the check mark and you're going to get a warning here what this is stating is that since we're cropping we're going to lose our astrometric solution that's okay i'm going to show you how to put that back in and what an astrometric solution is is basically the coordinates of your picture and it's important because uh, SPCC or spectrophotometric color calibration is going to need those coordinates, which tells spectrophotometric color calibration exactly where this image is at, and it assigns each and every star its color. Now, what we're going to do is just hit yes, and you'll see that the image is cropped. Let's zoom back in. And let's just check our work really quick. Look pretty good. Let's go over to the other bad area and we are looking good. So we'll zoom back out. Now notice how the image doesn't quite fit in the window anymore. At the uh, edges over here where we cropped. Sometimes that can be bothersome if it is. Over at my cursor, this little icon, click it, and we are fitted back to the window. So now we can go ahead and exit out of dynamic crop. Now we can extract the background. If you take a look, I have a very, very heavy gradient. Now, these gradients come about from a few different things, um, light pollution, this was in my northern sky, and I have the lights from the city of Phoenix in my northern sky. Um, and the moon can also, the, the light from the moon can also cause gradients in the background. And I'm pretty sure uh, I had a pretty good amount of moonlight when I shot this image. So I'm batting a thousand on this one. But we're going to correct it. How do we do that? What we're going to do is go to process all processes and we're going to go to dynamic background extraction. Now, if you need further assistance with dynamic background extraction, 
check out my tutorial. I have a link to that tutorial in the uh, description of this video. But basically what we're gonna do is click on the image, you'll get your crosshairs, and we're gonna just start placing samples. We're gonna sample the dark parts of the background as well as the gradient parts. Now in my tutorial for dynamic background extraction, I mentioned that in a uh, dense star field, as you see here, you can remove the stars, place your uh, samples, do the background extraction and put the stars back in. I'm just going to go ahead and leave the stars in just to kind of maybe give you another um, example of another way to do this. Now, because I have to work around the stars, I'm going to use smaller samples because I need a lot more of them. Okay. Uh, or I should say this, the amount of stars is going to cause me to have to use smaller samples, which means I need a lot more of them. Now, when you're placing samples, you want to avoid stars and you want to avoid structure, whether that be a nebula or a galaxy. As you can see in the preview window, we have a star. So we're just gonna click and hold on the sample and move it to a spot where we don't have stars. And we're just gonna go ahead and place samples all over the background, avoiding stars and structure. And if we get stars, we're just gonna move the sample. So I'm gonna go ahead and place my samples and then I'm gonna fast forward while I do that. And I'll bring you back as soon as I am done. Okay, now I have all of my samples set. In fact, just noticing a uh, this one over here was touching the galaxy, so I'm going to move, and this one as well. So I'm just going to move those away from the galaxy. Now I have my samples in both the dark areas of the background as well as the gradient areas. And what you'll notice in the corners, top left, bottom right, I have some samples that are red. Now that is the weight value. In fact, if we click on one of the red ones, we have a weight of zero. Now, we need to get that weight up. And what I like is for all of my samples to have a weight that is greater than 90%. And we do that with the tolerance adjustment. I'm going to move this sample really quick, just because that was touching the galaxy as well. So going back to our red sample, this these values are the default value for dynamic background extraction. Tolerance is 0.5. Let's bring it up to three and we'll click in another box. And now we can see our red sample now has a weight of 89.9%, 0.899, which is 89.9% of the pixels within the sample preview window are being used. Let's go ahead and click on another sample. And now we see that all of our red samples are now gray. Now that we can see inside the box, I notice that this sample is touching a star, so we're just gonna move that really quick. So the current selected sample, which is green, has now a weight of 88.7%. Let's bring our tolerance up to 3.6, 90.6%. Let's go to 3.7, which gives us 90.8. That should be a decent buffer. Now, my smoothing factor, I don't have a lot of well-defined structure within Andromeda, so I'm gonna leave my smoothing factor light. It's gonna be at the default of 0.25. This little uh, skip back button is gonna take us to sample number one. And I'm gonna use our uh, fast forward button over here. And I'm gonna rapidly click and simultaneously watch my weight as well as the preview box. I'm gonna make sure that my weights are all above 90% and my preview box does not have any stars. And what we might find is some stars in the previews in the corner since we couldn't see exactly what we were doing when we were 
replacing them due to the gradient. See a little bit of a star at the bottom. I'm just going to scoot that sample and we are going to continue on. Here's another one, also in the corner. We're going to do this for all of the samples. There's some. All of them in the corners. That's okay. That's the purpose of doing this step. So we know anything that we couldn't see before, we can now see. And we've already made our way back around. Just to double check. There's one that I don't really like. Okay, now that we're done, all of our samples are in both the dark parts of the sky and the gradient, no stars within the sample windows and all weights above 90%. We're gonna go to target image correction and we're gonna do a correction method of subtraction. Always use subtraction. Now what I like to do is take the triangle, drag it onto the workspace. That saves everything that we just did. So should we exit out of dynamic background extraction and we double click on that process icon, it brings everything back the way we left it. And this is good because let's say we make a critical error later on in the workflow and we have to come back, unfortunately, for some reason, we're at least somewhat ahead of the game and we don't have to redo all of what we just did. I'm going to take that process icon, move it off to the side. Now, once we have everything set up, triangle, drag and drop. Now, what we're going to do is exit out of dynamic background extraction. Hit yes. Let's move screen transfer function out of the way momentarily. I'm not sure why DBE is enlarging those windows like that. We're just going to roll with it, though. That's been a recent thing. Anyway, uh, here is our background extraction model. 24-bit stretch factor active, control A. This is what was extracted from our image. Let's go ahead and exit out. Now we're back into a, an RGB image, so we're gonna use screen transfer function. Activate our new image, which DBE was applied to. 24-bit stretch factor. Channels are linked, radiation icon, and there we go. That gradient is now gone. Let's take our original image. Here's a before and an after. I know it's a little bit hard to see with the size difference, I apologize, but that does a very good job. And don't ever be discouraged. Uh, this takes practice. Uh, this takes a lot of trial and error, figuring out what works best with your images, with your data. But don't ever be discouraged. Just keep on trying. Now, what we need to do from here is neutralize the background. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to process all processes background neutralization. The reference image is going to be our current image that we're working on. In this case, the image with the background extracted. We're going to click over at my cursor, that little icon, drop down menu, grab our, now keep in mind, we have our original image still here. So if we need to go back, we can go back. So select the correct one, in this case, image 05 underscore DBE. Hit OK. Region of interest. What we're going to do is, over at my cursor, this little icon is a preview icon. Click, go into the background, and choose some pure background. No stars, no structure from a nebula or a galaxy, just pure background. One of two ways that you can do this, you can grab over at the preview tab, 
select it, grab the tab, bring it over. You see next to my cursor, that's an X. If you move it up, it becomes a plus sign and now our coordinates are in. Or you can go to from preview, drop down menu, select the preview and then hit okay. Let's bring our image back up. So we have our reference image, which is our image and our region of interest, which is our preview, triangle, drag and drop. And now our background is neutralized. So we're gonna to go to preview, delete all, background neutralization can, uh, you know, you can exit from background neutralization. Now, what we need to do is restore our astrometric solution so we can run spectral photometric color calibration. First, there's one more item that will get rid of astrometric solution. So I recommend if, uh, if you need to uh, do this step now so that then you're not restoring astrometric solution twice. Now that item that also gets rid of astrometric solution is orientation. And if you take a look, poor Andromeda is upside down. So let's turn her right side up. And how we do that is image, geometry, and I'm gonna rotate 180 degrees. And now Andromeda is right side up and happy. So what we're gonna do now, since uh, we are through everything that would get rid of astrometric solution, now we're gonna restore the astrometric solution to the image. What we do is script, image analysis, image solver. Ensure active window is selected. Image scale, I like to go off of focal distance. Now Andromeda here was imaged with my Celestron on the XLT150, which has a 750 millimeter focal length. And that's what you're gonna place in here, your focal length of your OTA or optical tube assembly. And I used an ASI 2600 MC camera, which has a pixel size of 3.76. So you can get that from the manufacturer website uh, of your camera. These must be correct. And then what we're gonna do is search. We're gonna type in M31 or whichever target you're working on, hit search. Now we just choose the closest one that we have. I'm just gonna use Andromeda M31, no rhyme or reason, either one of those would have worked. Hit okay, and hit okay. Also in that window, make sure your date is correct. And what this is doing is assigning the spatial coordinates of the image exactly where it was at in the sky on the date and then SPCC is going to use that information, tap into the Gaia DR3SP database, extract the color wavelengths and assign them to the image and show it exactly how it is in nature. It's actually really cool. Exit out. Now our astrometric solution is reassigned to the image. Now we can go ahead and run SPCC. So what we're gonna do is we're going to go to process, all processes, spectrophotometric color calibration. If you need further help with spectrophotometric color calibration, Go check out my tutorial. I'll have a link to that in the description of this video. What I'm gonna do is choose my sensor. Now this, I, for this image, I used an Optolong L-Pro filter. The closest in the filter dropdowns is the Antlia Tri-Band. If you wanna know how I came to that conclusion, check out my tutorial. It's all within Curve Explorer. You're gonna need the Gaia DR3SP database downloaded and installed. I go over that as well in the tutorial. Region of interest. Again, we're gonna to need to come up over to where my cursor is, click to get a preview, zoom in, grab some pure background without any stars. 
Uh, the reason why I'm moving this is the diffraction spike on that star. I'm actually going to move my preview over to here. So I have a uh, nice clean background. And what we're going to do is, since I showed you through the tab earlier, we're going to go to from preview, drop down, choose our preview, hit OK. Now our coordinates are in there, triangle drag and drop. And now SPCC is using the ast astrometric solution, tapping into the Gaia DR3 SP database and assigning every single color. So this image is gonna look exactly the way it does in nature. And there you go. Now we're gonna go to preview, delete all, Exit out of spectra photometric color calibration. Next, what we're going to do is we are going to uh, run the full on blur exterminator. So we're going to go to process all processes, blur exterminator, uncheck correct only. You can run an automatic PSF. Blur Exterminator does a good job. I like to ensure that it's 100% correct. So if we uncheck automatic, we need a number to plug into PSF diameter pixels. Now, how do we do that? What we're gonna do is extract a luminance from this image over at my cursor, this little icon, next to the one that separates the color channels. This icon right here at my cursor, if we click, Ensure 24-bit stretch factor is active. Control A. Now we have a luminance. And what we're going to do is go to script, image analysis, full width half max eccentricity, labeled FWHM eccentricity. Ensure that our luminance image is selected in the dropdown. Hit measure. And this is going to spit out the median full width half max of the image. Now this only uses grayscale, which is why we extracted a luminance. Over here, we see the median full width half max is 2.608. I like to round to the nearest hundredth. So this is gonna round to 2.61. Now we can exit out and exit out of our luminance. PSF diameter, we're gonna enter in 2.61. Let me just click in any old box. Now our slider is set. Now it has the exact number that it needs. Triangle, drag and drop. So if you need any further help with Blur Exterminator, make sure to check out my tutorial. I'll have a link in the description of this video. Now watch these stars as this gets to 100%. Watch what happens. Beautiful. Now we're done with Blur Exterminator. We're going to exit out. Next is noise. What do we do about noise? Process all processes, noise exterminator. If you need help with this process, check out the link in the description of this video. I have a tutorial going over noise exterminator. Now I already know on this image, 0.8 does the trick. Let me do 0.7 really quick, triangle, drag and drop. And the goal here is to remove just enough noise, leave a little bit in there. Uh, you don't want to go too smooth. Now at 0.7, we still have, uh, you know, it got rid of it quite a bit. There's still a little bit more noise than I would like. Now, if you go to the top left of Pix Insight, you'll see a back button. Hit back. Now we're back to where we were before we applied Noise Exterminator. Let's go to point eight. Click in the detail box. Don't ever adjust detail. It's not worth it. Leave detail at default. I only clicked there so it accepted the point eight on uh, the noise. Triangle, drag and drop. And now we have just a little bit of noise. It smoothed it out beautifully. We don't have too much noise. We don't have too little noise. 
And there we go. Now comes stretching. Do you stretch with the stars or without the stars? Here's my personal input on that, my personal opinion. I like to separate the stars from here and process them individually and then put them back together at the very end. The reason, when you're working with a, uh, an image that has some faint aspects or even bright aspects as you see within the core of Andromeda, you can either overstretch the stars, understretch the stars, or overstretch the structure or understretch the structure. I'd rather stretch them individually, get better results, and then place them back later on. But it's personal preference. What I'm going to do is process all processes, go to Star Exterminator. If you need help with Star Exterminator, check out the link to my tutorial on Star Exterminator within the description of this video. Now, in that tutorial, you're going to hear me say if you are working with linear data, do not use unscreened stars, only use generate star image. I'm going to remove them now with unscreened stars. Don't be confused. Here's why. The stars are coming out linear and going back in stretched. So I get a better result if I unscreen the stars. Now, in dynamic background extraction, for example, you're working with linear data. So you're going to pull the stars out linear, run your dynamic background extraction, put the stars back in linear. You would just use generate star image. In other words, stars coming out linear, going back in linear generate star image stars coming out linear going back in stretched unscreen stars or if you're pulling stars out that are already stretched and then putting back in you'd use unscreen stars so if you have any questions on that don't hesitate to ask drop a comment in the comment section from here triangle drag and drop and what this is going to do is this is going to leave us with two image windows, one with Andromeda, one with stars. And from here, we're going to stretch. Now we can exit out of Star Exterminator. Let's minimize Andromeda for the time being. And let's work with the stars. From here, we can get rid of screen transfer function. We're gonna to go to process all processes, histogram transformation. If you need any help with histogram transformation and using it to stretch your stars, I have a tutorial on that. I'll have a link in the uh, description of this video. If you have any questions, if you have any questions on anything that I'm showing you, don't ever hesitate, drop a comment in the comment section. I love answering questions. Always hit reset. You may have something in here that you applied that you forgot about in a previous session. You don't want to accidentally apply it. So always hit reset. Uh, we're going to delete the current auto stretch on the stars. And we do that over at my cursor, this little icon. Now you may not see this icon. Depending on your system, you may have what looks like a little fast forward button. Click on that. These will appear. Click the icon. Auto stretch is gone. We're going to open up a preview. Grab the midtone slider, hold it left. Accept. Always reset. Grab the midtone slider, pull it left. You're going to stretch to your liking. This is taste. This is what you want. It's your image and however you want to have it set up. I like to use this as a um, almost a star reduction, if you will. Let's go ahead and accept that one. Reset. Let's check, see where we're at. I like it. We're going to run with that. 
Let's exit out of histogram transformation. Stars are now stretched. Let's minimize our stars. Bring up Andromeda. Process all processes. Generalized hyperbolic stretch. Let's go ahead and the icon over at my cursor, delete the auto stretch. If you need any help with generalized hyperbolic stretch, I'll have a link to my tutorial in the description of this video. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. To start out, we need to figure out where our symmetry point goes. We do that by clicking and holding in the background. You'll see to the right of my cursor, X, Y, and R. The R value is what we're looking for. We see 0 0.0002. I actually see a 0 0.0001, very small area. But we're looking for the lowest number, okay? Let's go ahead and hit the magnifying glass with the plus sign. Here's our histogram peak. Now you may find your histogram peak somewhere off to the right. Somewhere in here, if you ever need to move it left, like if you have a bright area and your background is bright to start with based off of the R value, you can move your histogram peak left. I go over this in my tutorial, but what you'll do under transformation type, go to linear, grab your black tone slider, pull it right, and you see the histogram peak moving left. That's how you do that. So what we're gonna do 0 0.0001 is our lowest value. That's going to be our symmetry point starting point. Now I'm going to grab my symmetry point slider. And if you take a look at the symmetry point box, as I move the symmetry point slider, you see how that number moves. I'm going to bring it until it's at 0 0.0001. Sometimes you may not be able to get exact like you're seeing here. You just click in the box, backspace the number you don't want, click in another box. Now we're at 0 0.0001. Let's click the magnifying glass with the minus sign so we can see our curve. Open a preview window. Grab your stretch factor and give it a stretch. And this is all to taste. This is how you like it. This is your image, your creation. We'll grab local intensity. Pull that. See how that core just came down a bit. And we can even do uh, fine tune adjustments on the symmetry point. How dark do you want your sky? So let's go ahead and let's protect some highlights just a little bit. This until I start seeing a difference. We'll go ahead and accept that for argument's sake. We'll reset. Let's grab an area for uh, contrast. Let's take a look. I think right over here should be good. Let's roll with that. Now, do you see the vertical yellow line? As I click and hold, that line dances around. That's going to show you where you're at as far as values. Since I chose that area to adjust off of, or since I chose that area to adjust my contrast, this vertical yellow line is a representation of the symmetry point. I can either click send to SP and that will put the value for this vertical yellow line into the SP box automatically, or what I prefer to do is grab my symmetry point slider and just move it over to the yellow line. Now what we're gonna do, stretch factor, do some adjustments on our contrast. If we take our preview button, notice how it says real-time preview, generalized hyperbolic stretch. If we click it again, real-time preview. If it is not showing the process that you're working with, then you're in a before screen. And if it is showing the process that you are working in, you're in an after screen. Now you're seeing the results that you are uh, adjusting. In other words, before, after, before, after. 
Let's go ahead and accept that. We'll go ahead and reset. One final stretch that's going to be off to the left side of your histogram peak. Grab your symmetry point slider, line it up, or just hit send to SP. And then we're going to go and give Andromeda one last stretch, trying to bring out some of the fainter dust in there. We'll do a couple of adjustments here. Let's bring local intensity down just a little bit and stretch factor down. Let's go ahead and accept that. We'll reset, exit out of generalist hyperbolic stretch, exit out of the preview. And now let's play with some curves. So what we're going to do is process all processes, curves transformation. And if you need some help with curves transformation, I have a tutorial on that as well. I'll have a link in the description of this video to my tutorial on curves transformation. And we're going to go ahead and uh, open a preview window. RGB, adjust contrast. So if we take that curve and bring it down. Notice how our background gets a little bit darker. If we grab the top, that'll adjust your DSO or your deep sky object. Obviously the bottom right resets. So what I'm going to do is drag that down, try to darken up my background just a little bit more. We'll run with that. Let's go ahead and accept. This is all to taste. This is you putting your touch on your image. Let's go ahead and play with some saturation. Pull that curve up. Before, after, before, after. Let's go ahead and accept, reset. Try to get one more curve in there. Before, after before, after. Accept that, reset, we'll exit out of the preview. Let's minimize Andromeda for the time being, and we will work with our stars. Open a preview window, we'll adjust some saturation, see if we can bring a little bit of life into these stars. We'll run with that, accept. Reset, exit out of the preview window, exit out of curves transformation. Now, if you notice, our primary image with Andromeda is image 05 underscore DBE. And what I like about Star Exterminator is it presets the image names. Our star's image is also image 05 underscore DBE underscore stars which is important for our star's back formula to work. And I go over this in my star exterminator uh, tutorial, as well as downloading and setting up PixInsight. So it's important that your names match. The only difference, the star's image has underscore stars in it. So let's minimize the stars, open up Andromeda, we have our pixel math formula with our stars back formula for unscreened stars, triangle, drag, and drop. And there you go, a finished Andromeda image. Now, how do you save this? What you're gonna do is go to File, Save As, navigate to whichever folder you wanna save it in, go to WBPP, and I have an image final, or an images final folder. And I have PixInsight Final and Shareable. The difference is the image in PixInsight is an XISF file, which contains all of the data possible. So if I'm going to open up and do future edits to an image, I'm going to use that file so I have all of my data still there that I can play with. So I'll go to PixInsight Final. I already have a folder for M31. 
drop down, choose the XISF, and I'll name my uh, images for what they are. In other words, M31, I like capitals when I do this, just probably my OCD, M31, this is an RGB palette, and we will have the date. We'll go ahead and save. I just leave this as default, hit OK. I'll go to File, Save As, go back into my Images Final Folder, go to Shareable, M31. And now I'll choose, usually I'll use between a TIFF or a PNG, just depending on what I um, am doing with the image. I'll just save this one, for example, as a TIFF file, carry it over the name M31 RGB 30 March 24, hit save. This is just stating that TIFF uh, format does not support some existing data. That's okay, you're always gonna get that, hit okay. I leave this as default. One thing to keep in mind, sometimes if you're working with a different workflow like HDR, for example, it'll save it as a 64-bit. Some systems can handle it, some don't. If you find that your um, file is not opening, just resave it as a 32-bit, and that should correct that problem. Hit OK. And that is the basic PixInsight workflow. So I hope that you found that useful. If you did, do me a favor, that channel icon that just popped up, hit that channel icon and subscribe. I don't want you to miss out on any future content. Drop a comment in the comment section. Did you learn anything new? Are you excited for this? What are you currently doing as a workflow? And then check out that next video. Until the next time, clear skies.